I was asked to do this just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I have been asked to do something like this before, so I must have some kind of a reputation or something. Um, <laughs> maybe that's it, the podcast. Uh, obviously, I'm Dr. Christian Shorey. Not so obviously, I am uh, an epistemologically agnostic secular humanist. Okay. Um, yeah, I, know, I feel like I'm in an AA meeting or something. Uh, hi, I'm Christian Shorey. Um, you know, when I say that, what I mean, epistemology is a theory of knowledge, uh, agnostic, I don't know, meaning I don't know about afterlife, I don't know about supernatural beings, I just don't know with the tools of knowledge that I have, and so I, I feel that that's the most honest and comfortable place my philosophy can sit is, hey, I don't know. Um, but then on the other part of that, epistemologically agnostic secular humanist, you know, secular is of the world. I say, I don't know about another world, so I'm going to base the majority of my philosophy in this world, okay? I know that my actions have consequences in this world, and uh, that I'm going to care about things in this world, and that's the last part of this, which is humanist, is of all the things in this world I care about the most, it's humans, you know? And the long-term survival of humans and their well-being. And it's... Um, kind of led me to a utilitarian philosophy of trying to, you know, have the best good for the most number of people for the longest period of time. And that's kind of where my ethics come from, in a sense. Now, uh, being in a secular group like this, obviously an elephant in the room is the subject of religion. So I wanted to discuss this real quick, especially in what it is and what it is not, right? Um, the word itself, if we go back to the base roots, re and ligio, what it actually means is to tie back. That we are tying back the, well, gosh, what is it we're tying back here? And it's funny, also, over in the East, we have a similar word, yoga, for, for religion, and that comes from a Sanskrit you, you, uh, root, yug, which gives you words like yoke and means to tie or to bind. You know, it's the same kind of a thing. Uh, what is it we're tying back? When I think about this, I think first off about my own consciousness uh, and that I'm an isolated island, and we all are, uh, and that this consciousness wants to belong to something else. I mean, that's, that's just a natural response. And so it's, you know, the consciousness wanting to be tied to the organic being. It's the, the organic being wanting to be tied to its, you know, species. Um, it's the the species wanting to be tied to its universe, and in some people's cases, wanting to have even a little bit more, because no matter how close I get to somebody, I, I can't you know, get off that island of consciousness. I can never be fully known by another person, and I cannot fully know another person, and so there is kind of a you know, deep desire in some people to be fully known, and to fully know, and I think that's where a lot of the ideas of a personal God come in. So. Um, Go over to the east real quick. If you go to the, the shrines and temples of the Buddhists, you'll find this, this face that's this horrible monster face sitting over the gates, basically. And um, the story of this face is rather interesting to me. Uh, the story goes that the great god Shiva was sitting around one day with his wife Parvati, and this uh, monstrous thing, this Asurara, comes forward, and, and, and its very nature is desire. And so it says to Shiva, give me your wife. And Shiva's Shiva. I mean, he's like, he just doesn't say a word. He opens that third eye and out projects the very mirror image of that Ashura, which is desire and hunger. And so there's this monster that is hunger, and it's coming right for the Ashura. And the Ashura is like running like mad, and he falls at the mercy of Shiva and says, please save me, I cannot deal with this. Um, and Shiva says, okay, well, you've fallen on my mercy, and as a god, I must give you my mercy. So, yeah, uh, hungry monster, lay off. And the hunger monster <laughs> looks at him with kind of a surprise. He's like, well, you made me, and you made me pure hunger. What am I supposed to do now? You know, what am I supposed to eat? And Shiva, you know, being a clever little god, says, oh, eat yourself. <laughs> And so he does, and he starts at the feet, and then he goes up through the knees, and he goes up through the waist, and he goes up to the neck, and finally there's just this face left. And, uh, you know, the story says that the, the Shiva just laughs when he sees this in delight and joy, and that the, uh, the ripples of his laughter are the Himalaya mountains, right? And, uh, and so you find these faces over the gates because Shiva said, you, I know you. <laughs> 
your life itself. And it's monstrous, you know, it's, it's a life that lives and, and in our case knows it's going to die too. Um, and that is a pretty heavy, heavy thing. But nobody gets to the ultimate realization of the universe without first going through that. And so he named him Kirtimuka, the face of glory. So you know, I've had experience going to art museums and people looking at this and going, I can't believe people worship this di demonic crap. I've heard that exact quote about this. Now, I, to me, I was like, do I think this story is true? No. <laughs> do I find value in it? Yeah. I mean, when I teach evolution, I kind of, that's just how I see evolution, you know? It's this face that's always moving forward, always consuming what went before, and, and, it's, and it's something new, and I'm a part of that face, and so I'm getting a religion out of that, right? <laughs> I'm feeling tied back to the, the total everything. Um, and that's what evolution kind of says, is we're related all the way back to one or organism, we're all related, not just in this room, but in all life, you know? And so there's a tie back there. So uh, you'll see that face around every once in a while, the, the face of glory. Now this leads us to some pretty heavy questions like, you know, why are we here? And this is a religious type of a conversation. Why are we here? Why is the universe made in such a way that it just seems to be just right for us? You know, and there's two ways to come at this. And since we're doing it from a human perspective, the best way to deal with this is in the anthropic principles. The first one well, it can be broken into two categories, the weak anthropic principle, strong anthropic principle. Weak anthropic principle just says, you know what, we couldn't be here having this conversation if the universe wasn't a certain way, right? I mean, why are there four large-scale dimensions? Well, you try to do it with less and you don't have an alimentary canal, you can't eat, you can't live, you can't, what, if, what about more than four dimensions large-scale? No, the planetary orbits become unstable and they tumble in. Why is it just four? Well, you couldn't talk about it if it wasn't. <laughs> um, so a lot of people like to point out these fine tunings of the universe and saying, ah, it's obviously designed for us, but weak anthropic principle says, well, not necessarily, because it has to have certain fine tunings for us to be here. So a weak anthropic has to have just the right conditions for life and intelligent to exist because it does. Uh, so our presence, our very presence constrains certain aspects of the physical universe. What about the strong anthropic principle? There's actually three flavors on that, participatory, final, and divine, right? <laughs> Participatory uh, anthropic strong principle says that we, the intelligent consciousness, us, we make the universe in some way. It, just, it is not a universe without the intelligence in it. And maybe you want to go into the philosophy side of that and say something like maybe um, consciousness as the observer and you have a subject and object and without a subject and object there is no, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so I have a hard time with that one. Uh, final anthropic principle says, yeah, the universe is, is kind of made for us. It's, it's designed in some way that we come out, and uh, once intelligent life is in this universe, it will be here until the final end. It cannot die out once it's in the universe. It's that integral to the universe. Uh, and the last one is, of course, you know, some personal supernatural being creates all of this and makes it look the way it does. Um, strong anthropic, you, you we're getting that sense that humans are absolutely necessary for this universe to be, or, or somehow integral to it. Um, and I always get suspicious with such comfortable, <laughs> you know, aren't we great um, statements, because it just, it kind of feeds into what you want to be true, that's for sure. Uh, so, is the, I can't say it's not true, that the universe wasn't made with us in mind, but I just, you know, I have some issues. Um, now, as far as that, uh, you know, divine intervention, if we do say there's a supernatural creator, I don't just think it has to be the, the biblical one, which is usually discussed in our community. Um, you know, it could be a divine creator that uh, actually directs evolution to bring humans forth and therefore know God. Uh, it could be an initiator of life. It could be a fabricator of the laws of physics at the beginning that allow life to exist. Uh, Lee Smolin has an idea that universes actually reproduce universes, and those universes which make black holes, singularities, tend to make other universes that start at singularities. Uh, and therefore, universes that make black holes tend to make more universes, and there's a natural selection of universes that tends to hone in on things that make universes that support us. I don't know. <laughs> Agnostic, right? <laughs> 
So uh, strong anthropic principle is a lot of what people think about when they're talking about religion. You know, when I talk about how I feel about these things, I have some people who we tend to, you know, say are religious, turn around on me and say, oh, well, you're just, you're just practicing your own religion. I have no problem with that. Yeah, I do. So what? <laughs> we all have our way of tying back to the phenomenal world, okay? So whatever it is we do to do that, that's our religion, if you want. Or if you want to use, you know, I use the story about Kirtamuka, that's what we refer to as mythology, right? Uh, Joseph Campbell wants to find mythology as other people's religion. <laughs> um, <laughs> she kind of hits, hits it pretty well, I think. Uh, now, of course, if that's religion and uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the sciences, I obviously you know, I'm showing you that I, I have an affinity for religious subjects. I have a, you know I have an affinity for scientific subjects. So how do I deal with the relationship between the two? Well, I know that there's three ways to approach it. One is a conflicting world's model that says, the subject matter of religion is the same as the subject matter of science, and the two are in conflict. One of them has to be right, and the other one wrong, or maybe both of them wrong. You know, that's a possibility. <laughs> science sure does work. Um, same world's model says science, uh, subject matter of the two is the same, and they're complementary. They can actually work together and maybe infuse to a new thing in the future. And then the last is the separate world's model that says they're dealing with two different subject matters, and so how could they possibly be in conflict, right? And this has been a big issue for a lot of philosophers. Averroes, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, their basic conclusions and all those guys was truth does not contradict truth. <laughs> You know, the truth of the, the spiritual world should not be in conflict with the truth coming in from the, the scientific investigations of our natural world. And that tends to lead to, to you know, some of these ideas like this. But let's look at those closer. You know, the conflicting worlds model could have two different flavors. Uh, one is, oh, could have three. One is religion is right and science is wrong. And this is what we call fundamentalism. And I, I don't know that anybody in this room is probably going that direction <laughs> if you're in this group. Uh, but you know how it goes in the West. Uh, God created the world. We'll end it. Those who believe have faith are saved for another world later on down the road. Um, and you think that you're going to you know, argue logically. This is, this is my Bible. It's I've had since I was 10. It is marked up. Um, you know, you find stuff in here that will say, okay, I don't care if you've got logic. Uh, that's not what we're dealing with here. If I can find my, hmm, there we go. Probably should have made a bookmark, huh? Um, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, let the cross, uh, lest the cross of the Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, of, uh, or since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For, Jesus demands, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. Yeah. You know, that idea. So it doesn't matter if you have logic on your side. Logic is going to close you off from this salvation, right? On the East, you get the same stuff. You know, in their view, it's an eternal world. You're a reincarnating monad in it, and uh, you're trying to escape this reincarnation by getting to nirvana, the no place. And science is an outgrowth of logic, which is an outgrowth of the ego, and that's going to hold you back from getting to nirvana, right? So uh, we hear these things in the East, uh, you know, the truth has is, is never been spoken. No tongue has touched it, no words have soiled it. You can't talk about it, so yeah. <laughs> uh, on the other side, is science is right, religion is wrong. There is no intelligent designer. It's, you know, that's the atheistic point of view. There's no purpose to life, but we can say that there is a, uh, an experience of life. That might be its purpose to experience it fully. But uh, religion is, is just this, you know, I often hear people say religion is a crutch. I, and I, I don't like that very much. 
Um, but there does seem to be this attitude in the conflicting world's models on the science side to say, well, religions, look at how it's gone through history. It's claimed this territory, it's claimed that territory, and science keeps advancing and pushing it back. Uh, this is what we call the God, God of the gaps argument when somebody says, well, you can't explain that, so that's God, right? Uh, but if you keep advancing forward, then God gets smaller and smaller and uh, in the end can be pushed right out the back door in this worldview. There are some actual attempts at doing this. I highly recommend reading e. Wilson's Consilience. Um, you know, there's this idea by uh, Tipler, Frank Tipler, the Omega Point Theory, you know. Uh, consilience basically is saying that there is one truth, there's one knowledge. We as humans, and especially us in the academic world, love to split it off into the natural sciences, the social sciences, the uh, humanities of religion and ethics, and we have our separate departments and we don't talk to each other, but what kind of reality is that? <laughs> because in reality, they're all one thing and we should be talking to each other, so we define this consilience as a literally jumping together of knowledge by the linking of facts and fact-based theory to explain what we see in the world. If these things are just human constructions, why can't we do away with them? <laughs> now, there are a lot of humanists and uh, evolutionary psychologists who can look back and kind of see the origins of our morals and ethics coming forward and maybe project into the future a time when we'll have such an understanding that you really can't see much of a, a difference between the two of these things as science subsumes religion, perhaps. And we do this a lot in environmentalism, too, that we've got to branch these areas of knowledge and it gets really confusing in the center of that circle. It gets a little bit more complex and complicated. The omega point theory, that's a fun one, I'll do this quick. Uh, this is based on a closed universe model, big bang, maximum expansion, and smaller, we don't know if that's true anymore, but his idea was we're gonna make these von Neumann robots, they're robots that can make themselves, right? They can reproduce themselves. And you give them human level intelligence, and uh, here comes the Terminator. Um, this, this graph, you know, it, it's, I got this from the early 90s, and it's a graph of uh, computing power and cost over time, and how by, uh, ooh, now we're going to have human level intelligence in a supercomputer. Okay, and by 2030 you'll have it on your desktop. <laughs> Uh, those of you who heard my lectures on consciousness, evolution of consciousness, know I have some big problems with that one. Uh, but, okay, let's say we get intelligent robots that recreate themselves, we send them out in the universe, they start making more of themselves out of the stuff of the universe, they start to influence the way the universe evolves, and as it starts to collapse, you can actually get the robots to control the collapse into a kind of a wobbling motion so that you can pull out gravitational shear energy even when the stars die off, and you're just constantly communicating, and as the whole thing collapses, the Robots are communicating with each other faster and faster and faster until you get to the very end of the universe and there's infinite information capacity transfer and you can recreate any quantum state, including well, this one in this room. So we can all be in an omega point at the end of the universe in an instant of time for all our lives, but would, wouldn't know it. And this is God at the end of the universe, a teleological God, uh, which is, you know, I am the alpha and the omega, right? So that's science trying to give you religion. Um, separate world models, science and religion are not in conflict because they deal with different subjects. And Stephen Jay Gould said this deals with non-overlapping magisteria. You know, science is the empirical universe. What's it made of? How does it work? Religion is the moral meanings and values. What are the proper ethics on a situation? What are the spiritual meanings of our lives? Science gets the age of rocks. So, yeah. <laughs> Religion gets the rock of ages. <laughs> Science gets to tell you how the heavens go, and religion gets to tell you how to go to heaven. Um, that kind of a thing. And it would be really nice if the borderland between here was a big no man's land, right? And we could clearly distinguish between the two, but they do butt right up against each other and complexly interdigitate. <laughs> You know, you start talking about stem cells. I can talk about this from a purely scientific point of view. You know that I can't do that in the public forum, though. I've got to bring in the religious, spiritual, ethical aspects of it as well. And uh, don't mind doing so, but I do recognize them as, I, I feel they're two different subjects on that topic. And most topics I deal with, I feel like I'm, I'm in two different topics. When I'm doing science, I'm doing one thing. When I'm doing religion, I'm doing another thing. Uh, and so if they are addressing separate subjects, then we're, we're going to need both as we go forward in the future as humanity. And as far as 
the idea of getting rid of religion. I, really? I mean, for one thing, it's here. For another, I don't see how it's going anywhere. You've you got to learn to live with it if you don't like other people's religion. You still have to live with it. Um, so, you know, this, we need to kind of clearly define where religion ends and where science ends, and we shouldn't be stepping on each other's toes, right? If religion can't dictate the natural factual conclusions properly, scientists can't ha say to have any higher insight into morals and ethics just because we know the empirical world better. Uh, and that leads to mutual humility. And I hope that when this group goes out and talks to people who are of religious backgrounds, you, you respect you know, the mutual humility from both sides. Now, if somebody religious starts stepping into the scientific turf and telling you the Earth is 6,000 years old, you have perfect reason to you know, tell them they're full of it. Uh, you know, the, the evidence is so overwhelming against that idea. To me, it becomes absurd for me to hold it. So uh, I will argue against scientific uh, arguments that I hear from religious groups. Obviously, I do a lot of debating with creationists and such. So, um, yeah, that is, is kind of what I wanted to say to you. And that uh, I do think that ethics and morality come into this group strongly. And I think every one of you knows it. Um, I support, you know, charity work. If this group wants to do it, I'm happy to do it with you. Uh, I think that's kind of the, the goal and the mi mindset that at least I come from as your advisor. So <laughs> at least you know who I am as your faculty advisor, all right? So that's all I had to say. Did I stay in my time? Good. Okay, good. Thanks. I was given a 20 minute time limit on this talk and if I was given maybe 10 minutes more I would have given this last bit which I think is a, a kind of a proof towards the separate worlds model, the non-overlapping magisteria model. It's not an absolute proof but I think it, it definitely has led me to feel this way. Uh, and this deals with uh, another religious text, the Mandukya Upanishad. And, you know, in these traditions such as Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, you know, meditation is very important. And I have to admit that when I was younger, I uh, thought of meditation and things like that, and candles burning and incense as being just hippie crap. I, I didn't really appreciate the hippie philosophy. It seemed uh, too much of a loose thinking system to me. And so I rejected it pretty strongly, but I have to admit that reading the Mandukya Upanishad did change my mind on some aspects. I've also read texts that show that meditation has great health effects, uh, both bodily and mentally, so I've, I've got to say, yeah, that seems to be true too. But this um, chakra system that comes from this meditation process is what I want to kind of focus on at the moment. Now, there are said to be these seven centers through your body along your spinal axis basically uh, I don't believe they actually exist I think these are mental constructs that help us group our thoughts and, and aspects of our inner world now at the very bottom is the root base and this is just the alimentary canal you know the, the eating uh, digesting processing excreting that thing that which basically all life does the next chakra up is at the groin, and it's known as Svadhisthana, the favorite resting place. It's obviously the sexual desires, no matter how they be inflected. The next chakra up is at the navel, and this is Manipura, the city of the shining jewel, the uh, wish to control, dominate, dictate, those aspects. And then you come up to the next level at the heart, and this is the central chakra. And it's kind of the axis of the wheel. And this chakra is known as anahata, which literally means not hit, which refers to the fact that every sound we hear made is made by two things hitting together. If I clap my hands, my voice itself, these are two things striking together. But anahata is the sound made when no two things strike together. What is that sound? Well, I, I found this written in the Mandukya Upanishad, and it said that the sound is Aum, which is represented by this symbol here. And this is one of those hippie things that I really didn't care for before, but when I read the description on this word, it made a lot more sense to me. Aum is said to be the four-element syllable. That 
When said properly, it starts at the back of the mouth, then fills the mouth, then closes the mouth. Aum. And that represents the birth, life, and death. It also, when said properly, is supposed to pronounce all the vowel sounds. Aum. And that all words are just vowels broken up by consonants. And so all words are just fragments of this one word, om. Now, this four-element syllable part, uh, what are the four elements? The first element is ah, and that is said to be Aristotelian logic, where I am not my computer, my computer's not me, I'm not you, you're not me, the table's not me, I'm not the table, A is not B, B is not A. And this is how we operate in science, by having our subject-object relationship be separate, and we try to explore the two separately. Now, everything we study within science and Aristotelian logic is in the past. Uh, the uh, objects that come to our senses have to take time to get there and then get processed, and so these are all in the past. So the next element of the word om is u, which is said to be dream sleep. That in a dream, you dream a, a subject and an object. I might be dreaming about a computer, and so there's an I and there's a computer, but the computer in the dream is me, and I am the computer. <laughs> uh, in a dream, I am the table. The table is me. I am you. You are me if I happen to dream about you. Now, here's an attempt to try to prove this more experimentally. I want you to stare at this picture at the central black dot. Just stare at that black dot in the middle as long as I'm talking here. Uh, and what we're doing is uh, basically saturating some cones in your eyes to do a little visual experiment here. Now, the colors that you see there on the screen are Aristotelian logic. They are in the past. They take time to go from the screen into your eyes and then get processed. Uh, so, properly, you are not those colors, and those colors are not you. However, keep staring at the central black dot there. If I do switch this over to a blank screen, you do see colors of an opposite form than you saw before. And you think you're seeing colors, but they're not there. There is nothing in the real world corresponding to those colors. Those colors are you, and you are those colors. A is B, and B is A. And this is absolutely in the present. You are experiencing immediately this sense of color and we can reacquire those color differences if you want to in that picture now the last element of the word om is said to be mm, which is deep dreamless sleep where when you're in deep dreamless sleep you're still a consciousness but you're a consciousness of nothing no thing and that that is an even deeper type of consciousness this is kind of where the, the yogis say they're trying to get to, you know, their meditation is towards a, a consciousness that is awake and yet not conscious of any thing. Lastly, uh, well, you said this is the four element syllable, so what's the fourth element? We got the whole thing, ah, uh, ooh, mm, right? Well, the fourth element is the silence out of which it came and back into which it goes which underlies the whole thing, and it's always there. And, and so I, I use this example as a way to say that my Aristotelian logic deals in one camp. My religious aspects are off in another camp, and I think they're separate, and that they're not overlapping. Uh, and so I go for the non-overlapping magisteria. Now, at the very beginning of this talk, there were several religious symbols up on the screen, and... I did say that I feel like I do have a religion of a kind, and you might ask me, so what's my religious symbol? And if there's anything out there that's going to be my religious symbol, it's this picture. It's a picture of the Earth from space rising above the dead moon. It's that oasis up there where all humans live, and it strikes you so hard that it says, what are you doing, Earth, in heaven? What are you doing, silent Earth? That is the place that joins me
to my organic being, to my species, to my biosphere, to my universe. It's that image that causes me to see past the differences of black and white and gay and straight and male and female and say, hey, it's all secondary to the human condition. And so I leave you with that idea and hope you've enjoyed this discussion on science and religion and what they are and are not, where they can cover and cannot. And I hope that you can go forward with this material and, uh, you know, have some good discussions with other people in a respectful manner with mutual humility. So thank you all for your time and take care.